I don't like that. Put your tongue back in your mouth. Put your tongue in your mouth and close it. What are you doing? Stop it. Actually, that's not bad. <laughs> oh my gosh. Rob Riggle. Uh, I should hate him, but I kind of like the time he shows up. Why would you hate Rob Riggle? I think <laughs> Rob Riggle's phenomenal. And he like he he basically makes anything that he's in, he makes it better. Right. Right. But he never uh, takes away from a movie or a TV show. He just, but like, I would never never want him as a main character, right? I yeah, I don't know. He's got he's got the weirdest vibe to him because he like he was on SNL for like a year and then got kicked off or something. Yeah. Or like fired. I don't know. I love Rob Riggle. Yeah, okay, he good. I I, 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 I shouldn't feel guilty about Daily it. Show about Natalie Holloway, which is a tragic thing, but it was literally the funniest thirty <laughs> seconds I've ever seen in my entire life. Just look up Daily Show Rick uh, Rob Riggle, uh, Natalie Holloway. It's unbelievable. I'll check it uh, out. Welcome to Film Trace. This is a podcast where we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception. It is the start of our third cycle. We did self-aware horror. We did existential thrillers. And what are we doing now for our third cycle, Chris? We're looking at absurdist action, which, uh, you know, we talked about just keeping it simple, action comedy. (sighs) But it uh, doesn't quite work when looking further into film history than like the eighties. Right. Um, and I think there's something to be said for the fact that a lot of the films we're going to be talking about throughout the course of, uh, you know, from the fifties all the way to today, movies that are classified as action, but also just tend to be funny or because they are absurd in their depiction of action that's what makes them funny so some of these films are going to be straight up comedies that have action in them some of them are straight up action films that have comedy in them and yeah there will probably be a couple especially when we get to the 80s when it's like that's when the action comedy was born but uh, the threads go back deeper than that like they do with most subgenres. and what film that is our new release for 2022 that we are going to kick it off with dan before we delve into the deeper and arguably better years of absurdist action. We're going to do the new uh, Brad Pitt vehicle, Bullet Train, which came out earlier this month, August of 2022. It is, I think it's one of the reasons why we chose to do this theme or this cycle. We saw this movie coming up. We want to do more comedy stuff. I will say this is one of the more difficult back and forth that we've had, right? And yes. trying to determine. Yes. self horror horror, easy. We got it. So easy to pinpoint. Existential throws was a little bit harder. This one is absolutely the hardest because of all the things you said. It's like what action movies make very much sense. Everybody knows what that means, right? Uh-huh. Absurdist action, action comedies. There's a lot of layers to it in kind of to figure out. I was thinking about it the other day. It's like there's like Michael Bay movies, like right. Bad Boys, which are going to cover. Uh, that's absurdist, but absurdist in a very specific way. Then there's straightforward comedies that are have a lot of action on like it was like nice guys yep uh big trouble little china maybe um and then there's like the meta ones uh like last action hero or i would say 21 jump, jump street kind of falls into that mm-hmm. where do we where do you think bullet train uh kind of fits in this whole echelon or you know complex idea of absurdist action you know, it's one of those films that, you know, if if we weren't just timing it with 2022 and we, you know, maybe in 2050 revisited the idea of the action comedy or absurdist action, um, where unlike Men, which started our existential thriller cycle, and even the Scream uh, requel, which yes. started our uh, self-aware horror um, uh, cycle, Bullet Train would... I'd, I'd venture to say just be a forgotten film. Uh, (laughs) The only, the only thing that makes me, you know, uh, hesitate to say that is that it's a Brad Pitt movie and not a lot of Brad Pitt movies are forgettable. I'm the Mexican, but there is something to this movie that just feels so out of place, especially having it come out in 2022. And a lot of the critics have uh, said this, and I'm sure you came across it in your research, just like I did with mine. Um, it's that whole, you know, post Tarantino uh, ripoff feel. Yes, yeah, totally. Re- like resurrected, <laughs> you know, at, at when Tarantino has long removed his, his own career for better or worse from that whole vibe. So it's it's strange. It's a out of time, out of place, forgettable, but also just uh, are I'd say 
of the three 2022 movies that we've covered this year for the podcast, uh, without a doubt, the worst. Wow, strong <laughs> words to start out the uh, the bullet train discussion. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think, uh, yeah, just the initial watch of this, uh, I saw it in a the theater about a couple days ago. I fell asleep uh, right in the beginning uh, for a little bit and then kind of woke up. I was like, oh, yeah, nothing's really changed. It's still the same. It's one of those films that feels, on the one hand, I understand the initial criticism of it being a Tarantino ripoff. Someone, I think the rap said it's from the, the things to do in Denver while, while you're dead period, which I think is hilarious because yeah. it's very true, which is a movie that no one remembers, by the way, unless you were like around back then. Right. Um, it definitely has that feel, but I think there's also another layer here. And I think someone on letter letterbox said something like this. It's it sort of, there's a, there's a Scott Pilgrim mm. sort of feel to it um, that has a very, it's very kinetic and has an animated sort of vibe to it in terms of the constant cutting and editing and the interludes. Um, so I think, yeah, thematically and story-wise, it's definitely a throwback to the 90s. But I do think there's something here that feels a little bit more con- uh, contemporary. Um, what the hell but, is this movie about? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'll come back to that Edgar Wright comparison because we're going to talk about Hot Fuzz later, mm. uh, actually in the next episode, Yes, um, with a uh, guest uh max coville rotten tomatoes approved critic which will be fun but yeah bullet train what the heck is it about it's about a train full of bad guys and there is a suitcase full of money the end i what I, <laughs> it's, oh, it's there's so, so much stupid what are you talking about <laughs> it's so God, stupid you hated this movie didn't you oh, oh, i hated God. it a lot it uh yeah you know there's uh if i had if i did describe this to like uh my parents uh, I would say, you know, Brad Pitt plays a really chilled out hitman uh, who's on a train, uh, has to get a briefcase, and then he's fighting with other hit people um, to sort of get the briefcase. And then there's a really bizarre gonzo ending uh, where Michael Shannon shows up. Sorry, spoilers. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> no. You're not going to care about the end. Um, I love the tagline, too. The end of the line is just the beginning. What do we think about that? That's great. The, no. Um, <laughs> how about my initial? I have my initial watch notes that I made right after I saw it. Way too much happening. Really boring for some reason. The main character has little to no depth. The plot is basically indecipherable. Uh, I think those are all pretty fair, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think especially that horrible, incongruent feeling of being bombarded with uh, sensory <laughs> overload, but also being just flat out bored. Like yeah. it's it takes a special it takes a special combination of forces to to have that effect on you. Who's responsible for this? Who <sighs> who's that? <laughs> I feel bad because I had such high hopes for this guy. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Is David Leach? Leach. Yeah, Leach. Leach, Leach cause, yeah, because he leeches off everybody. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I absolutely adore the John Wick trilogy. Um, I'll even uh, you know go up against detractors of the sequels and say that yeah. you know the the first three films we'll see about number four. Um, but David Leach uh, co-directed the first one. Um, uh, didn't have anything to do with two or three, but I, I think I kind of don't get that either. I was looking into this, and I was mm-hmm. like, "Well, why did he get a co-directing?" Thing? It sounds like oh. Keanu Reeves approached him and Chad Stalski, yeah, Stalski or something like that. Um, he got the credit. Chad got the credit, but uh, David didn't. It seemed very odd, and the, the DGA sort of ruled that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's not involved in any of the set. Something is off to me about it. Right. It seems like a really strange relationship that was going on back then with this. Well, with they John were, yeah, which is they, an amazing movie. Yeah, and they're they're both former stuntmen, right? Yes. Um, that was he kind used of to be Brad Pitt's stunt guy, exactly, right? Um, including in the Mexican. So it seems <laughs> like there's uh, a, a kind of a divide. Um, I mean. Uh, I guess I don't know a lot about stunt person history in uh, cinema, but it seems like that was a pretty uh, novel um, thing, right? That these two guys sure. decided to go behind the camera in a c- creative place, right? Yeah. Um, cl- it makes sense because they know so much about action and they have so much experience being, you know, on the other side of the camera when it comes to action. Uh, but it, it is really that creative vision where it's like that the, the universe of John Wick is so like, brilliantly constructed and iconic and just like instantly like lived in 
um, even though it's so strange. And y- y- you can make an argument that, like, Leech is trying to do something similar here, um, but without any real work put into it, right? Where it's like, he wants it to be strange and offbeat, but with but it just feels it just feels all over the place, right? And I think a large part of that has to do with the script, which is uh, based on a novel called Maria Beetle, and uh, it was just recently published in English. It's a Japanese novel, and so it's uh, an Americanized Japanese story. And literally, the screenwriter—I forget his name, um, um, oh, Zach, gross. Zach Olick something. Oh. Olkowitz? Why, why can't any of these white guys have easy last names? <laughs> um, he like goes out of his way in the press circuit to talk about how little he knows about Japan. <laughs> like, you're, is, I think that's biz- yeah. I, I, I kind of don't get because I mean, when this first got announced, there was like the whitewashing conversation, yeah. which was mm-hmm. you know it happens and it probably needs to happen with a movie like this. But then the author comes out, Kotaro Osaka, who wrote the book, and he's like, um, "What did he say?" Uh, da, 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 da. It could have uh, been any. They don't have to necessarily be Japanese characters, yeah, right? He goes. He created a motley crew of characters who are not real people, and maybe they're not even Japanese. I don't have any feeling of wanting people to understand Japanese literature or culture. <laughs> it's not like I understand it that much about Jap- uh, Japan either. So, okay, you got a whitewashing thing going on, which makes sense. Now that the author's like, yeah, whatever. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Still, kind of strange, I would say. Yes, yes. Um, it's like almost like kind of like this. Like, let's excise this conversation about the movie and just move on because you want to make a lot of money. Is what it sounds like, right? But there's still um, all these stylistic elements that are oh, lifted, right? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Um, and I mean, it's an interesting movie too because, like, when they talk about the conception of this, it, 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 this is a COVID film, by the way. Right. Yeah, that's important is, to note. It's really kind of strange because they talk about like how this came to be and all this sort of stuff. It's a very traditional route. You know, someone at Sony got it. Um, I think it was David Leach's creative partner. They read it, said it was fantastic. They passed it around. Brad Pitt gets involved. Um, you know, and they wanted to, it kind of made sense to do it during the pandemic because it's a small, you know, it's location, kind of one single location on the train for the most part. Uh, and it just seemed like, and in all the notes that I read, it was just very clear that everybody was kind of outside of shooting the scenes. Everything was really siloed. Mm-hmm. Like people weren't, the editors weren't really working together. They were in different locations. It just felt sort of like it, it felt like a COVID film. Yes. Uh, or yes. it's not the traditional means of production for a film, right? It just felt a little bit different, a little bit off. Uh, and it's actually one of the reasons why they chose to do it because they feel like they could actually do this film justice in those work in, in the work environment that existed during the height of COVID. And this is really shot during the height of when things, people weren't sure how things were going to play out. Um, do you see that on the screen now? Do you, does it feel like a COVID film when you watched it? You know, and I, I read that after the fact I saw an yeah. early screening and then read up on the film. And it was one of those things where like during it, you feel like something's off. Yeah. And, and for me, like my initial surface read was just like, there's just so much like, artifice right which i was kind of struggling with especially during that first hour or so you're like is this intentional is is this just like (laughs) because that's the easiest cheapest thing to do but like uh it's just very strange when you have like a you know the the cinema version of a bottle episode um even like a high octane action flick like this Mm -hmm. and yet it still feels like it's it's all fake like you're looking at nothing but you know, just garish, uh, CGI. And then after the fact, I'm just like, Oh, that, I mean, that makes sense. Like literally probably the only things that are not, uh, green during production are, you know, the actors in their clothes. I, maybe the seats on the train, but like every shot just, you know, and there's an argument to be made. Like you mentioned the parallel to Scott Pilgrim and a lot of that movie feels like fake and artificial, but that's part of the vibe they're going for, right? This kind of like video game manga aesthetic and with bullet train, because it feels like everything's coming from a million different places, Tarantino, uh, Japanese shoguns, uh, video games kind of i don't know it just feels like it feels a lot more like spaghetti being thrown at the wall which makes sense in to some degree then that like you're in the middle of the the height of covid and 
I don't feel like anybody's really thinking straight. <laughs> well, it's funny because you like even when they're talking about the script, like I can find a couple of things, a couple of points about the pandemic here. Like uh, in the conversations I had with Brad, this is the director, David. Uh, the number one goal is to make a movie that's entertaining and escapist mm -hmm. and fresh and original uh, that will make people want to come back to the theater. Or um, he also said we're at the height of the pandemic. Uh, he's paraphrasing Brad Pitt here. Uh, we should be le uh, leaning into laughs. We should be looking for laughs and broader is better. Let's swing for the fences. <laughs> I mean, that's just like, I think the one of the things that I've heard in sort of thinking about this film and seeing the trailer, when I saw the trailer, I did you like the trailer? The, the tra honestly, yeah, the trailer piqued my interest. I thought it was great. I thought yeah. the trailer was fantastic because it, it really sort of is like, oh, this is going to be a fun, enjoyable romp. Right. I'm all about broad and escapist, but yeah. it's, but I didn't laugh. But it doesn't work. Movie. It doesn't work as a feature film kind of at all. Yeah. Like it just um and so it's like they I, I don't know that much about the novel, but I think the novel's a little bit darker. Mm. And I think there's a, there's several cuts of this film out there. And it seems like as they were editing it, they kind of came across a vibe and tone that was leaning heavily into the comedy. Uh especially what are the two uh brother hitmen? It lemon yeah, and tangerine, lemon and right? tangerine, yeah. Uh, very comedic, and I think that that's one of the things that works a little bit better, but not it's not sort of pitch perfect yeah, at all. No, <laughs> uh, like the Thomas the Train Engine stuff. I, oh god, I just wanted it to end. I don't understand. Like, is that like I don't know? I, and I, I don't yeah, know how no. to approach that. And I, I've never really been a fan of Aaron Taylor Johnson, but he's really trying here. And I have been a fan of yeah. Brian Tyree Henry here, and it feels like he's not trying. <laughs> So <laughs> oh, I thought he was great in this. Uh, uh, whatever. Um, uh, each through their own. Um, but I think that the, the the thing that stood out to me in sort of trying to like engage with this movie, even from the start and knowing all about it and following sort of the box office projections and stuff like that, was like, oh, this is going for the Deadpool crowd, right? Right. right. The rated R, lots of violence, lots of swearing. And Leech did Deadpool two. Deadpool so, two, yeah. exactly perfect. And so, but like on screen for whatever reason, this is probably, you know, talking about a broader aspect of a sort of absurdist action is sort of like, why doesn't this click, you know, because Deadpool, I think clicks really well. And there's a style that you can do this movie where it works. It's like, why does this thing not hum? It just, mm, it's boring. Yeah. It's super boring. And yeah, uh, I don't really know why, because, um, I mean, the thing that the thing thing that sticks out to me is sort of kind of what you mentioned. It's kind, it's just not funny. Yeah. Uh, and I think Brad Pitt's shtick here, which is like a very specific sort of blasé attitude, kind of like almost like a Big Lebowski esque hitman almost. Um, it, it, that doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't. It didn't. It's pretty shallow. Right. And it didn't really go that deep to me. So I don't know what you thought. Like what didn't click. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the Big Lebowski because I was trying to figure out, like, you know, where is Leach talking about his influences here? Because especially with, you know, arguably is mostly Stelsky with the first John Wick and with Deadpool 2, that's kind of like a hired hand thing. Um, so it feels like where what is he latching on to? And the thing that he talks about in most of his interviews when it comes to inspiration is the Coen brothers. And mm. that is like, like, if, but once again, it feels like a very surface level reading of Coen brothers, right? Like he's picking and choosing those little, like the zaniness of raising Arizona, the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. very like, um, teenage read of, uh, nihilism. Um, it, it, nothing ever really clicks in terms of ultimately, I think when it comes down to is like, and we've had this conversation with the existential thriller cycle when it comes to like philosophical protagonists. Mm -hmm. And ultimately when that philosophy is deep and earned, uh, that's when it works the most like George Clooney and Michael Clayton or Michael Douglas in the game. But yeah. in here, if we're talking about like absurdism and there is obviously a very absurdist, uh, um, edge to Brad Pitt's, character but it's something we've seen so many times before now which is like the the hitman or the the criminal that is trying to uh live a better life right 
Like mm-hmm. he's been through therapy. He's done the Tony Soprano thing, or he's done the Sam Jackson and Pulp Fiction thing. Like it literally is lifted from a, a thousand nineties and two thousands sources and never really like, uh, either delved deeper or like had a, tw- like there's no twist on it. Right. So mm-hmm. it's like literally just re- replicating all those prior beats or like you said, yeah, Jeff Bridges and big Lebowski. And yeah, so I you, mean, ul- you ultimately have like an empty protagonist filled with like a motley crew. Sure. But like a motley crew of just caricatures. So there's never anything really to like make me want to laugh or want to care about what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's very simple, like, lack of story stuff. There's no meat on the bones with the protagonist at all. Mm-hmm. Like, there's zero. And it's like, I, you know, part of this, I think, is in the process of adapting a novel. You feel like, on some level, you have to hit all those notes that are in the novel. And I think it was even more difficult. I think the novel's like 500 pages long. <laughs> yeah. Condensing that into, well, this movie is pretty long too. It's over two hours, way too long. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to translate all that into a script is very difficult. And I think they tried to do it a couple of different ways. What's interesting too is that um, I totally agree with you that there is a style here that feels very kind of what we mentioned before the post Tarantino, I call it like the post Pulp Fiction era Yeah, where it is using, or, uh, you know, what we would call back then postmodern tools and narrative techniques to sort of rearrange how you're experiencing the story. The problem is, and this has always been a huge problem with a lot of, um, I'll call it postmodern art is that, those techniques only work when you actually have a good story. Yeah. And having a good story is incredibly hard to do. It's one of the hardest things to do, especially in filmmaking, ironically, is before you even, you know, turn the camera on, is having a very rich and interesting, well-written script. Uh, And that's not happening here. Um, And it's one of those situations where... it does feel a lot like style over substance, which mm-hmm. is kind of a kind of a rote thing to say about movies. But I think in this case, it's very true where the style of the film and the look um, and the immediate sort of reaction that they're looking for in every scene overrode any sort of broader wide scope narrative uh, goals of that. Like, it, mm-hmm. it's just like, how do we get people to engage how do we get people to get excited uh, every minute? And the problem is it's like little firecrackers going off, but nothing stringing together to go any deeper than that. So it ends up being a very shallow movie across the board. I found interesting and sort of looking the editor did an interview um, and she was basically like, we shot it one way, like the novel was. And in the novel, it's like each chapter is a new character. And they introduce them one at a time slowly and it kind of builds up. Yeah. They shot it that way. But when they went back and looked at it, they're like, no, it's not really working. What we need to do is recut the whole movie (laughs) and intersplice the characters so that it's not so siloed. But they didn't actually do that all that much because there's the Mexican um, cartel guy who they do the old style, right? Yep. They like completely separated it off. And that, that I actually followed that more. And then in that sort of fight with Brad Pitt, that it, it added a layer of importance to me because I knew his story, but with the rest of them, especially, um, Tangerine and Lemon, I, I needed more right. to like go off of. So I don't know. I mean, it's it, the big question in my head is with what they shot. Probably do you think that there is a film here that would have worked? Uh, it's, I don't think so. I do think that I do agree with you that the, the bad bunny, um, character, uh, that was one of the only interesting parts of the movie to me because they like not only did his whole chapter kind of separate from the rest. And then it has arguably kind of a clever, you know, just like, Oh, and, and he's dead, uh, uh, (laughs) cap to it. And because there's like no dialogue, right. They like use a lot of, you know, silent film. He talks about Buster Keaton too. Leach does. Um, and that's the only place really, I see any of that kind of influence really, um, where it so much is told visually and it's like, Oh, maybe there is like, uh, something here. And it reminds me a lot of uh, Leach's 
one of Leach's other films, uh, Atomic Blonde, which I also very boring to me. Um, but there's like, there's like one or two scenes where you like, like they got the music synced in it's eighties. It's got that kind of Russian cold war backdrop and it's really sleek and feels really inspired, but only for like, like five minutes. <laughs> and then, and then it's back to just boring nonsense again. Um, so I do think that like, if they had put as much, thought and time into the other side characters or even just like scaled back. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like there's ensembles and then there's, you know, too much, too many cooks. And uh, if they had scaled back and really like given as much credence to the characters stories uh, as they did with the bad bunny character, then yeah, maybe, maybe there would have been something, but like, especially the way they did, not only does it become uneven, but also it just like, it's just that kind of like, I mean, the faculty, right? With just like the freeze frame and character names. And uh-huh. so many movies did that in the post Tarantino era, uh, including him and his friends. And it just, it's just gross. It just feels like I'm so sick of it by the time yeah. the fourth or fifth character gets freeze framed um, that I don't, I just wish that uh, there, I wish that for a movie that's supposed to be small, like it, all the action happens on a train it like just it tries so hard in so many different categories and i don't know i don't know did you see i'm curious uh because i feel like there was some a similar kind of argument to be made uh for the only other leech movie we haven't mentioned yet which is the uh, fast and furious hobbs and shaw i know i did not see that yeah, I'm not I, f- I, I checked out of that uh <laughs> series after uh tokyo drift actually i haven't seen one since Okay. Okay. But it seems like that that's, it's almost become his calling card where it's like either he's a hired hand and he just tries to do too much or he brings an original, uh, story or adaptation and, um, just doesn't know what to do with it. So it's just unfortunate because I think there's enough, uh, there's enough clues there. I would do, do you disagree? Like, I think there's, there's elements here and we obviously saw it in the trailer too, since we both, um, were interested by that, like, is there any hope for this guy in the future? Is there something here that still has the possibility of becoming something fruitful in the future? I mean, I think just his involvement with John Wick alone gives him a lot of hope and promise. Mm-hmm. Because I, I do think, like, looking back at John Wick, which came out in 2014, that really revitalized action movies yeah. uh, across the board. I mean, it is literally, there's a stylistic, there's a stylistic difference before and after John Wick. JW, if you were. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's like, I think there's something here. And, and, and thinking about Bullet Train, like what worked for me was a lot of the action. Yeah. Like the um, the the quiet car fight, the fight in the trailer, which they smartly put in the trailer with the water bottle, stuff like that. That all worked for me. Um, I, I, I think the problems here are story problems, yeah, which is ironic yeah. because it came from a very successful novel. Um, I think from a plotting and editing and just pure adrenaline aspect, the movie, um, works. The problem is that you need that plus, uh, emotional stakes and there's zero emotional stakes in this movie, like literally none. And the ones that they try, the father son thing, Ugh. um, uh, jo- what's Joey Adams? Is that her name? Um, Joey King, Joey King. Sorry. Uh, she, her thing with the, fu- what? By right. the end, it's like you have, you can't just throw emotional stuff in. Um, like it's like, you know, it's just like, like you said, throwing spaghetti at the wall. None of it's going to stick because you have to build that up slowly throughout the film. What are the emotional stakes for Brad Pitt? Is he actually the protagonist? Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't even know. Like there, it, there's a bizarre. lot of, there's a lot of cameo reveals, obviously. And that's at the, at, at some point in the last 45 minutes, it's like the only thing I'm mildly interested in just because everything else isn't working. Um, and so there's supposed to be this relationship with, uh, between Brad Pitt and like the, the, I don't know what you'd ca- call her, the woman on Hamler. the, yeah, the handler. She, she's on the earpiece, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's the reveal of who she turns out to be in the end. And but then it's just like, like it that that was like the nail in the coffin for me, where it was like the reveal wasn't about like the emotional connection between these two characters. It was just like 
check out the movie star we got right and it feels like a some sort of contractual thing for all the <laughs> people that work for Sony or something you know what right. i mean right yeah like yeah Jenny tatum show is uh i mean it's like all these oh, random yeah. people you're like i i guess yeah like, sure thank you am i supposed yeah. to say thank you <laughs> it's just so bizarre but um, y- the emotional stakes thing um i was taking a perusal at your notes and uh there's a really obvious connection not necessarily a post john wick uh thing but almost concurrent is that a really mediocre kingsman series yeah god right Mm. and i i i kind of feel felt very similar after seeing the first kingsman movie where i'm just like there were like i i have no memory of it anymore uh but like where it's just like all empty spectacle right and it's like trying to be both funny and uh high octane and you I don't know. It's just like, it's just, it's unfortunate because like you said, uh, it seems like in the past, you know, six, seven years, we've had a a great resurgence of people figuring out how to, um, make action, uh, a spectacle, but also have that, um, emotional connection. We're going to talk about that in a little bit with, uh, 21 jump street, speaking of Channing Tatum. Um, but because there's, yeah, because the emotional stakes don't feel true. I, like that's the other thing is like the chemistry between characters, uh, and maybe that's part of like the 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 siloed like isolationist COVID um, filming. Like obviously the the big chemistry that we're supposed to feel is between Tangerine and Lemon, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson and Brian Terry Henry. But even there, uh, when they're probably given the most like duo screen time out of all the characters, and there's a lot of characters, mm-hmm. like even then I'm still just like. You know, they're <laughs> Brian Tyree's Henry's slipping in and out of accent. Aaron Taylor Johnson <laughs> is focused more on like looking cool in a suit. And, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just, it, it feels very much like, um, um, and I, I think we're going to have this conversation when we talk about Edgar Wright, where it's like you have hot fuzz, which is him arguably at his Zenith similarly sure. with Scott Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. And then he gets to finally like let his teenage ego loose with baby driver and it just like it kind of works but not really and this feels like just an overblown version of that like leech finally just got to unleash because he got his like he literally got his doppelganger uh who's the biggest movie star of all time to <laughs> to be the lead and so he there's no like there's no reigning in there's no real logic to it yeah it's it's just a messy film and I think that like audiences are kind of reacting the same way. You know, just looking from the business side of it, this budget was eighty six million dollars, which is not small. Yeah. Uh, and it's done what? Was, the new numbers just came in today. Actually, it's done fifty four million domestically and worldwide. It's up to one fourteen. That's okay, but it's actually not doing super well uh, for the amount of marketing they put into this. And it, it's not going to be a super successful film. And I think that you're right. It's one of those films that's not going to be remembered all that well. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit forgotten. This is a good moment to jump into 21 jump street though. I feel like, cause sure. I feel like 21 jump street, um, kind of popped off. We got 21 jump street. They've got, was it 22 jump street two years mm-hmm. later? Yeah. Both very successful films. Uh, yeah. In fact, the second one did a hundred more million dollars worldwide. I was looking at. So these That's are like insane, big, big movies. You know, how do we look at something like that now? Is that a similar type of absurdist action? What kind of, um, you know, layer is that on? That's because Twenty One Jump Street is what more comedic, right? More meta. Yeah, this is that kind of action comedy where it, if blockbuster still exists, it would be in the comedy section. It would not be in the action section, and yet. Yeah, it's meta because it's uh, based on or uh, technically a sequel to the long-running uh, TV series from the 80s, which was very much just like a straight-up like crime drama, I guess. I don't even know if that would necessarily I be called really an remember action it all series. That well. No, Do you remember I've, it all that well? Did you watch I remember, it? I remember actually attempting to watch it because of this movie. Interesting. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't do it. I just, it's, uh, I don't know. Even, even with like... Uh, um, you know, my penchant, my, you know, arguable weak spot for like teen dramas. It is it, still, I don't know. It's, it doesn't age well, but I think that's the whole point is, and Lord Miller, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, the writers, directors of um, 21 and 22 jump street said is like, that's the whole point of, 
taking that property and revitalizing it, right, is because they didn't want to, you know, take something that already had a great reputation and try to satirize it or turn it into a Jonah Hill comedy. Because Jonah Hill had picked this specific title, it was a, it, they saw like an in, it was an opening, like, Nobody's going to be hurt by tar- quote tarnishing the reputation of this you know mediocre eighties series, even though it has its you know league of uh, probably Gen X um, fans, but it's not like you'd get offended by it, especially because they managed to you know ten year old spoiler alert get you know the two of the main stars. I think actually a third one shows up at some point in the movie too from the series to come back and reprise their roles in this yeah. one. It's, so, uh, I need your history with this film because I have a lot to say about this movie. Mm-hmm, I just mm-hmm. have a lot to dive into here because it's just a fascinating film. Now, first of all, is this a requel? <laughs> yeah. They, Did they, yeah. Requels? Oh my gosh. I bet Lord Miller saw Scream 2022 and said, uh, thank you. We did this first. A 10 um, years ago. Right. Because it really does fit that description to me. It's not totally. really a sequel. It's not really a reboot per se. It's like a weird in between thing. Did you yeah. see this one came out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I was uh, uh, very much um, kind of champing at the bit because, especially, uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller were the creators of Clone High, uh, MTV animated show from the 2000s that God, my wife and I were. <laughs> <laughs> we were huge fans of and so uh they had just put out uh, cloudy the chance meatballs which is obviously a children's film great movie though right it is great yeah. and uh the sequel's not bad either and you have uh you know a chance to like see what they're up to in terms of like more edgy adult humor but also like they have so much like clear like joy and child like energy about them that uh, I was excited to see it when it came out. And I'm, I mean, honestly, I've always been a fan of Jonah Hill. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, uh, any of the naysayers that said that, you know, he couldn't do what he did in Moneyball. Uh, I hope are eating their words because he's, <laughs> he's turned out to be one of the, you know, I think maybe, is he the best Apatow verse actor? Jeez. Oh, this is such a limited, <laughs> uh, no, you're probably right though. That's actually a really good point. Like about yeah. that crew of people. He's the one, I mean, Wolf of Wall Street, he's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, he's so good. Um, he, yeah, and he's just, he's got comedic chops. He can do the drama thing. He works better in drama, obviously, when it's over the top and absurd, right? Because yeah. that's how he kind of fits in. I, I think he's great in this movie. I think he's wonderful. I think Channing, Channing Tatum's way better. Revelation. Yeah. I mean, Channing Tatum, to me, and someone said this on Letterboxd, it came or, or Reddit or something. I was like, and I just saw a dog. Did you see that? Oh, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> Come on, dude. What are you doing in your life? You gotta see these movies. Um, would, my, would my kids like it? Uh, it's really sad. I won't have kids see it. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> it's really depressing. Um, uh, but Channing is just... Um, what is it about him? It's like his comedic timing is just so on the money. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know how how that started. Do you know how it started? I don't know that much about Channing Tatum. All I know well, is he should have been the game. It moved, but never happened. Oh, my gosh. I still dream about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, was his his breakout hit was Magic Mike? I guess I don't even know. Uh, which have you seen that? Right? Oh yeah, it's fantastic. I love Magic Mike. So good. Um, yeah, we got we're gonna do real time research, folks. We're yeah. doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it seems like back in '06 he was in uh, She's the Man with Amanda Bynes, uh, okay. which was his kind of foothold. Um, GI Joe. Ooh. Yeah, GI Joe. Uh, I mean, he did like Dear John, though. You remember that movie? Right. He was all over the place. This guy yeah, can do that's anything. Like a, like a Nicholas Sparks novel. <laughs> You're right. That's crazy. Yeah. So 2012, 21 Jump Street, and Magic Mike. How mm. did they even select him for this then? I don't see anything in his past. It's like, oh yeah, he's got great comedic chops. No, he's, no. He can really, he can really hold up with Jonah Hill, who's you know obviously because of his past and his, the Apatow stuff is considered one of the best you know improvers out there. Um, right. Well, so. What's the rewatch like on this for you? Uh, you know, because before we even outlined uh, this cycle of episodes, I had just rewatched it for fun um, because uh, my mother in law had never seen it, and yeah. uh, she, I mean, she likes comedies, but she very much, you know, was a little aghast by the amount of <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of crudeness 
Um, but whatever, she still enjoyed it. So I mean, that's another point for this movie. It, it's not just youthful, and it doesn't also just hit like our us elder millennials and Gen Xers. But I think that it's it's a crowd pleaser no matter where who's watching it. And I think that uh, one of the reasons it came up in conversation, which made us, which led us to uh, my wife and I to rewatch it with my mother in law, was that like um, uh, specifically. Um, we got on a conversation about, and I, we, we had the cold open start with this about like movies and TV shows that do the usually pretty trite, like characters are on drugs kind of thing. Yeah. And like, this is one of those things where we talk about revitalization when we referred to like John wick and, um, the action genre, like in terms of comedy, that's like one of the oldest things in the book and they somehow make it like amazing again like the, and, and wolf of wall street does too by the way but like how can it's it's just really impressive and i think it comes down to who's uh behind the camera and phil lord and chris miller not only did cloud of chance meatballs they went on to do the lego movie and they um you know have the infamous story of attempting to do solo the han solo movie and then getting kicked off and so like they've become and then spider verse mm-hmm. um they've become kind of uh um I don't, I don't know if I would call them auteurs yet uh, because they're so mainstream, but yeah. like they, they just, they have such a knack, not only for making great movies that uh, attract people of all ages, but the rewatchability fa- factor, right? Like this isn't just a movie that I rewatched because we wanted to talk about it for the podcast and it's, you know, important to the subgenre or has an anniversary or whatever, but just like, this is a movie that I want to watch all the time because it's just that, funny and it's just that enjoyable and you want other people to see it to see how funny it is how about you what's your what's kind of your history with it back from release day to the rewatch so i kind of was not watching a lot of movies back when this came out Hmm. so i missed this probably for the first couple of years Uh, and i probably saw it 2014 i probably even saw the second one first or something like that uh it was probably on hbo and i saw it and i as much as i sort of was sort of into it back then there was always something about it that kind of threw me off. And I've watched it a couple times over the last month because there's something odd about this film that I just don't like. Really? There's something, yeah, there's something off putting about it. And I think it's mostly, I've been really um, thinking a lot about like, and I, this is always something in the back of my head, like rated our comedies and sort of the Apatow verse that we were talking about in the mid 2000s you know, old school stuff like that, that was going on then and how comedy shifted so dramatically around 2009. I always pinpoint the hangover and the massive success that that had in 2009. Really, it felt like to me, it changed comedy, comedy a lot. And this movie coming on in 2012, it, um, it, to me, um, I think one of the things that sticks out to me about this film is that the comedy here it just feels so ungrounded and kind of cruel in a lot of ways. Mm. And it just doesn't, I don't know. There's something off about the types of laughs that they're going for where it doesn't, uh, there's just like weird moments. For instance, I'll give you an an example. There's the moment when they're at the house party, uh, Jonah Hill gets into a fight. He gets stabbed with a knife, like in (laughs) Mm -hmm. his back. And like they, um, they pull the knife out, or Ch- Channing Tatum does. Everybody screams, uh, of sort of with excitement. Then Brie Larson, who shows up, uh, in this movie, she's she's pretty good in it. Yeah, uh, she pours a bottle of vodka on it, and then they just start jumping around and dancing like nothing happened. <laughs> There's like, and totally absurd, right? Yeah, yeah, it completely fits the absurd action of what we're talking about. But to me, it's sort of like that's the type of comedy or type of narrative universe that you would have in a movie like Dodgeball. Yeah. You yeah. Know what I mean, like it's a very sort of, or Zoolander, fun movie, right? right. Uh, but it's, I, to me, 20 on Drum Street lives in this weird no man's land where, on the one hand, it's trying to have this grounded story about two people who realize that, like, um, you know, they're not, they're not exactly who they think that they are and their weaknesses aren't exactly their weaknesses and stuff like that. There's a growth element to it, but completely gets obliterated by the end of the movie, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's trying to do a little bit of the Apatow super bad type thing, like a grounded emotional narrative comedy. 
Uh, but on the other hand, it's also doing this outlandish start skiing, hutch, dodgeball, Zula type thing, Tropic yeah. Thunder. And, and, and to me, it's like that's a very hard balance to to hit. And to me, it just doesn't work. Wow. Uh, it's funny, but like I just, ugh, I get like a weird feeling about the Is, movie. It's sort of like, ugh, I just don't really want to rewatch it. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. So I'm curious when you think of like, uh, more recent films that do successfully blend action and comedy. What does come to mind? Like post 2010, like post hot fuzz. The one that comes to mind is always the nice guys. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's Shane black, right? So you've got one of the originators from, uh, the lethal weapon scribe. Exactly. Yeah. He, Uh, to me, he gets that balance. I mean, other stuff that comes to mind blockers, I thought was pretty good, but that's more of a comedy comedy game. Right. Right. Yeah, Game Night's good. good. Sort yeah. of like, but even those films, both of them are perfect examples of this sort of style. There's, I, I, and it's really hard to put into words uh, what it is, and maybe it's just an age thing. Yeah, this, I mean, it's, this there feels has like been a this, Zoomer movie, right? Right, it, and it has like Blockers is a good example where it's like the jokes in that movie are so good, but it does have this kind of like homogenous uh, feel to it. Um, we did a, we just recently did a guest spot on uh, Forgotten Cinema. A uh, great yeah. podcast of about role models. Another movie that kind of fits that uh, that style, where it's like or lack of style, like it doesn't really have anything um, uh, thoughtful or artistic behind it, but it's just like a laugh machine. Um, but the thing that I keep coming back to with Lord and Miller and Twenty One Jump Street and and the sequel too, which I think um, is not is not quite as funny, but still hits pretty good, hits pretty hard for a sequel. For a comedy mm-hmm. sequel, um, is that there is this kind of what they do balance really well, I think, is that kind of like shaggy aspect of the Apatow verse, um, with the kind of real like they, they I don't know, it's it is very much manufactured. They talk about this in their interviews, like they have to go back and really remember like what makes the relationship at the center of the film work. And I'm sure they do that like with Cloud of the Chance Meatballs and Lego movie too. Like it's mm-hmm. it's very self-aware, but it's also very manipulative um and yet because and i think going back when we talk about chemistry with bullet train and the lack of it there uh it the like jonah hill and channing tatum literally do become really close friends because of the production of this movie and i think it really lives there on the screen even at its most absurd moments it feels like these are actually two guys that were enemies in high school that now like can't live without each other (laughs) And I and that's something that I don't get from like Dodgeball or Tropic Thunder. Like th- those are those it's are just true. laugh yeah. laugh machines that are like twisted inside out of uh, you know meta homogeneity. And that it, I don't know. That's the that's the part that really like just gets me. Um, yeah, with, I mean their chemistry is duo. undeniable. Mm-hmm. Like it's just obviously that they that's the thing that makes the film work. I I guess I'm more. <sighs> And there's also like the the constantly calling out of like, and we're gonna talk about where these conventions started, like like the buddy cop movies later in mm-hmm, this cycle, mm-hmm. but like the Nick Hofferman type speech, which is funny, <laughs> yeah, or like Ice Cube, right? Like, right. It, it's sort of it, it's the requel thing where they're pointing out, hey, this is a convention of these movies, and if I say it out loud, and we can laugh at it but then we can still do it. Right. It's just like a very, it's a going back to like thinking about this in terms of like bullet train where there's a style that he was imitating. And he, I don't think he under really understands why that style worked for Tarantino or other artists like him back in the nineties. Yeah. But the quick editing, the, the um, braided narrative, stuff like that. I think similarly here, like with Miller, Lord Miller, who are, I, I think are great creators and artists it's like they're leaning into this type of comedy and i don't even know what a good example of this would be outside of this film um i mean i'm thinking some of the more cerebral comedy like an arrest development or something like that very dry very ironic um but they just it doesn't to me they can't pull it off like it's just not that's not funny to me pointing out that uh, Ice Cube is an angry black man who plays their sergeant. Yeah. That no, I, that's not like, that's not, it, it's like a point, point, wink, wink thing. Right. 
Right. It, those are the lesser moments of the film. I would agree. And I, I, yeah, I don't think this is like, maybe I'm, I'm fanboying a little bit because I love rewatching this film, <laughs> but it, it's, yeah, there it, it's got its flaws. And one of the things that I also think Lord Miller are good at, but maybe they don't have, qu- they perhaps didn't have the, quite the gauge on in 2012, especially in terms of like thinking about longe- longevity. Cause they're still definitely much on the like upspring of their career at that point. Yeah. Um, is that like, you know, they, there, there's a three hour cut of this movie somewhere um, because yeah, they just absolutely. had so many ideas for jokes and uh, Hill and Tatum came up with so many ideas for jokes on set. And ultimately like it came down to, you know, being in the editing room and deciding like which, uh, which beat is 1% funnier than another one. Right. And yeah. so I do on the one hand, like I, I love the pace of this movie. It, it kind of eschews the the Apatow flaw of uh, running too long and feeling b- overly baggy in some spots. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it's like, and you know, there, there's arguably some homophobic stuff too, right? That's not going to yeah, play as well course, ten years yeah. later. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's just like I don't know. It makes me think of uh, I don't know what's. Can you go back twenty years? Like the the the, the best comedies of the two thousands, where it's yeah. like comedy is a real hard genre to be perfect at. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's very, there's a very short list of perfect comedies that um, both age well and, you know, still make you laugh as much as they did the first time. Um, But this is for me anyways, this is despite those kind of trappings um, is one of the ones where I just like, Oh my gosh, the way that Channing Tatum says science, I could watch it over a thousand (laughs) times. I mean, the, the only reason I'm so hard in this movie is because it's so uh, acclaimed. Mm. Like, if you go back and look at, like, it has a top score among top critics on Rotten Tomatoes as a 90%. Yeah. 90. That's right? crazy for, like, a mainstream comedy. Mainstream comedy. So, like, it, this movie hit at the right time with the right group of people across the board. The masses, the, the, the critics absolutely loved it. There's like two negative reviews among like top critics on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, so to me, it's sort of like it's one of those movies that I think worked incredibly well back then. But as I look back on a little bit more, it's like those flaws, especially with like requel stuff happening now. It's like, oh, this is kind of where it started. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's not any better now than it was back then. And it's sort of the negative thing that we said about Scream and all that sort of stuff and that kind of triteness. To me, I see it here. And it's sort of like, oh, this is the this is kind of the origin story of right, like right. post postmodernism, where people are using those tools in a way that they've they've seen other people use, but have no idea how they actually work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or like what the point of them is. But I don't know. I mean I mean the thing about this too is like uh I was really fascinating to see that Lord and Miller have not directed another film recently i know what's the last film this is the last film they've technically directed or like 21 22 jump street and lego movie in 2014 yeah and they've yeah. had nothing in the last eight years besides like a lot of production and spider-man and writing across the spider-verse i that mean it blows my mind they got so they got signed on to uh do solo in 2016 yeah so like you're two years out from Lego movie and 22 jump street. And they've also like are got, they're producing all the Lego sh- offshoot movies. Um, and so I, I'd imagine that uh, they probably got really soured by the directing experience because they've got like, they've made their name in all these like huge franchise names. And they, you, you could be li- literary about it and say that, you know, by, you know, starting this whole requel business, they kind of, you know, are, are paying the price now for what they, what they started. Um, but yeah, it seems like they are much more comfortable now in that producer's role. They helped us, they helped bring us Mitchell's versus the machines. Um, they're bringing us cocaine bear next year, finally, yeah. mm-hmm. um, which I'm super excited about. Um, they are going, they obviously they just got the, the next two spider uh, verse movies um i guess the next thing that they're gonna do finally is uh adaptation of project hail mary the <laughs> i looked at these two book. they're coming up i was like adam what are they doing <laughs> i don't know any sense man that's what it blows my mind because it also blows my mind because uh 22 jump uh 22 jump street was so more successful than this one mm-hmm. than the first one it's like where's the third 
Right. Like, what are we what are we doing now? Well, like, do we know how the machine works. Well, it wasn't it there was that whole drama with the 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 Warner Brothers leak and the 21 Jump Street Men in Black uh mashup? Do you remember uh, this? I don't remember this at all. Oh my gosh. Fill there was in, Jonah. In. So Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum supposedly like spent a whole like <laughs> vacation together getting high and writing uh, a third 21 Jump Street in which it coincides with the Men in Black universe. And then the script got leaked in that whole, uh, you know, the whole, the same leak where, uh, um, Oh, the Sony leak, the Sony, the leak. Sony yeah, leak. Yeah. That's what yeah, it was. The Warner interview Brothers. and Seth Rogen, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think oh, it just kind weird. of went DOA then. And I'd imagine also Lord Miller, um, they're not, they're also doing TV at this time, right? Yeah. Last man on earth and all that. So like, it's just a problem of in having too much to do, I'd imagine. And it just gets lost. Maybe they just call it DOA once uh, once the script gets leaked, and it's such a weird idea for <laughs> for a <laughs> third movie in the trilogy. I don't know. Maybe bizarre. we'll get in a few years when things calm down. Uh, okay, so Bullet Train, kind of pulling back to absurdist action. Bullet Train, I, I think from the action perspective, really, that's the only way that it works and doesn't work very well. Mm-hmm. Um, 21 Jump Street, to me, I think, despite all my negative stuff about it, from a comedic angle is fantastic Mm -hmm. right it's still it's it's funny it's hilarious across the board the action part of it's kind of like zany um a lot of set pieces and stuff like that which i don't think work all that well um that's not what's memorable about the movie correct it's the lines it's two people talking to each other yep right which is like when we go back to a lot of these movies it's going to be buddy movies where they're talking to each other and that's where it's funny Exactly. And the action's just kind of like interspersed to keep you engaged, I guess. I don't know. I'm just waiting for the next, you know, conversation, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. What do we got coming up on uh, the next couple episodes in this cycle? We right. Have a lot of cool stuff coming up, don't we? Uh, the 2000s going to be interesting. We're talking about two British films, uh, Hot Fuzz and In Bruges. And then we'll get into the 90s back uh, across the Pondo America with uh, Bad Boys, but then also a Chaser film. We got to talk about Jackie Chan at some point. Yes, we have to. Um, so we'll do uh, Drunken Master. And then uh, 80s, of course, uh, we've got to talk about uh, the arguably first um, official uh, action comedy, 48 Hours. Um, and uh, 70s, we'll talk about Thunderbolt and Lightfoot with Clint Eastwood. And finally, we'll da- go back to Asia and talk about the Japanese absurdist action masterpiece, Branded to Kill, which, have you seen that, Dan? I have not, no. Oh my gosh, that's going to be a I haven't fun seen a lot of the older finale. movies that we're looking yes, at. Yes, so it's going to be, gonna be uh, an exploration for me, at least. Uh, thanks for listening. This has been Film Trace. Film Trace.